Anti-government protesters plan to shut down Bangkok tomorrow. Mixed reaction to the death of Ariel Sharon. And the CE expected to announce subsidies for the working poor in his policy address. Good evening. Anti-government protesters in Thailand are plotting a bold move aimed at ousting caretaker Prime Minister Ying Luck Shinawat. As Sonia Artero reports, they plan to cripple the government tomorrow by shutting down the capital of Bangkok. Occupy Bangkok. That's the latest marching orders thousands of anti-government protesters will carry out on Monday by blocking 20 key intersections in central Bangkok. By preventing government officials from getting to their offices, they hope this move will finally force Yinglet Shinawat to resign. Many have traveled from around the country to join the anti-government protests. They firmly believe Yingluck is just a puppet for her billionaire brother, former Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat. He was deposed in a 2006 military coup and is now living in self-exile. Despite the recent violence, demonstrators are gathering peacefully. But some Bangkok residents express concern the shutdown might incite more violence. Since protesting began in November, eight people have been killed, including two policemen. A case in point, just last night, five people were injured, one seriously, when someone opened fire on an anti-government rally in Bangkok. Because the city employs 3.5 million people, Thai businesses are worried the shutdown will hurt them financially. We would like to ask the, all the party concerned to try to uh, soften down this uh, impact to our economy. This economics professor agrees. He believes the Thai economy would suffer a downward spiral and the Thai bot would be weakened further. There is a, a, a big impact on, on Thai economy, especially in uh, investment sector. To alleviate the chaos, the Thai Transport Ministry has set up a traffic war room to solve inevitable traffic woes. Meantime, Ying Luck is trying to solve her own political predicament. She's dissolved the lower house of parliament and called for snap elections in February. But certain that her Poi Thai party will win again, the opposition Democrat party is backing protesters by boycotting the polls. Sonia Artero, TVB News. Reaction from around the world is pouring in after the death of former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. One of Israel's most iconic and controversial figures, Sharon altered the course of the Middle East. He died in hospital on Saturday at the age of 85. James Aitken reports. Israel's flags are lowered to half-staff in remembrance of a man who some called a hero and others called a criminal. Israel's hard-charging former prime minister and army general had been in a coma for eight years after a devastating stroke in 2006 incapacitated him at the height of his power. His health had rapidly declined over the last week. In a televised address, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a rival and harsh critic of Sharon, called him a courageous fighter whose memory will be enshrined forever in the heart of the nation. Among Israelis, opinion over Sharon's legacy remains divided. I'm happy that he died. Why? Happy because he, he, ch he chased Jews out of their homes and he caused them suffering. So it doesn't make a difference to me that he died. It's a very sad day. Uh, I liked Ariel Sharon. He was a, I think he was a very good prime minister. Sharon led a remarkable life, a farmer who became a soldier, who then became a politician and later a statesman. When he was elected prime minister, he spent his first term crushing a Palestinian uprising and his second term withdrawing from Gaza. When he was elected prime minister, he spent his first term crushing a Palestinian uprising and his second term withdrawing from the Gaza Strip. 
In Gaza, where Sharon is remembered as someone who caused destruction, death and displacement, Palestinians celebrated in the streets. After the pullout, Sharon's new political party was cruising to election victory when he suffered the stroke that would seal his fate. Ehud Almert, who replaced Sharon, said he was not a warmonger, but he was smart and realistic and understood the limits of wars. He will remember, be remembered, I think, in Israel as the essence of the new Israel. He was everything to everyone in Israel. He represented something that was truly Israeli. Sharon's body will lie in state in Jerusalem before a state memorial on Monday where world leaders will gather. His body will then be taken by military escort for burial at his family's ranch in the Negev Desert. James Aiken, TVB News. A team of Chinese divers today succeeded in the country's first 300-meter saturation diving, a technique that's commonly used in deep-sea exploration, rescue and construction operations. After conducting experiments in laboratories, China launched its first saturation diving mission at sea three days ago near Shenzhen. A diving bell carrying three divers descended to 313.5 meters under the South China Sea before returning to the mothership shortly after 5 a.m. today. Saturation diving technology enables human beings to withstand high water pressure by saturating human tissues with inert gas. Before entering water, divers will live in a chamber injected with a mixture of helium and oxygen. This will allow them to stay underwater for a longer time and at a greater depth than conventional techniques. After the safe return of the three divers today, a second batch of three began another saturating diving attempt at 8 a.m. China is working to develop saturation diving techniques that will work at a depth of 500 meters under the sea. Currently, eight countries, Britain, the United States, Switzerland, Norway, France, Germany, Japan and Russia have mastered the 400 meter saturation diving technology. The chief executive's policy address Wednesday is expected to cover subsidies for the working poor. Sources say the longer the number of working hours, the greater the subsidy in each household that qualifies for the benefit may claim about $2,200. Stephanie Choi has more details. According to the poverty line set by the government, Hong Kong has more than 150,000 working poor, employed individuals whose household income falls below 50 percent of the median income. Sources say the government has plans to subsidize these families. Families with an income that falls below 60 percent of the median income can apply. For example, a four-person family that earns no more than $17,000 a month. Sources say the subsidy per household will be about $2,200 and it is calculated based on the number of working hours. Those who work 140 hours a month can claim the full subsidy and those who work 70 hours a month can claim half of it. Since the aim of this policy is to encourage individuals to reap the fruits of their labor, sources say even new migrants who have lived here for less than a year can claim the subsidy as long as they're willing to work. Chief Secretary for Administration Carrie Lam mentioned earlier about implementing a policy to help low-income families with children. In order to prevent intergenerational poverty, working poor families with underage children will receive $600 to $1,000 per child. The policy is expected to benefit 150,000 families or more than 400,000 individuals. It's expected to take effect as early as the end of this year at an annual cost of $2.5 to $3 billion. Right now, the Community Care Fund provides a $3,500 one-off subsidy for individuals not receiving social welfare and living in private housing. The government's Work Incentive Transport Subsidy Scheme also gives a $600 subsidy to needy individuals, whether or not they have to take public transport to work. James Tian, a member of the Commission on Poverty, suggests the subsidy for low-income families should merge with a transport subsidy scheme. He believes even with the low-income subsidy, employers will not offer less pay increases to the workers. Stephanie Choi, TVB News. There are growing calls for the government to focus on social issues in the CE's upcoming policy address. As Ronnie Samtani reports, several political parties petitioned the central government offices this morning. The Democratic Party urged the chief executive to deliver what he had promised in his election campaign. 
I think the government uh, had, you know, during his uh, 14, uh, f uh, the first 18 months, has been uh, repeatedly delaying all the implementation of his promises. What we have been urging him is uh, to uh, implement his promises during his election, in particular, you know, uh, realize uh, all his uh, election platforms. Uh, like, you know, uh, increasing the uh, housing supply, uh, the uh, 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 OH uh, allowance, special OH allowance, and also the uh, retirement benefits for the uh, general public. Meanwhile, the Hong Kong Association for Democracy and People's Livelihood proposed that the government should set a poverty alleviation target. It also called for the construction of 30,000 public housing units and 5,000 home ownership scheme flats a year to deal with the housing shortage. The Civic Party wants the government to set aside $50 billion as seed funding for a universal pension scheme. It also demanded genuine universal suffrage in the 2017 CE election without pre-screening candidates. The Democratic Alliance for the Betterment and Progress of Hong Kong called for a special subsidy for the working poor so that low-income families that are not receiving comprehensive social security assistance benefits will receive $1,200 a month to help cope with their expenses. And the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions asked the government to ban the use of workers' mandatory provident fund money to offset severance payments. We, we want to protect our labor to have a better, better retirement life. We want the government to know that the final destination is to uh, completely set off, to, uh, to, to cancel the set off of the system. There are a wide range of demands from the public for the upcoming policy address, with many complaining about rising inflation and increasing hardships. It's evident that the chief executive will face a challenging year ahead. Rani Samtani, TVB News. And still ahead in our news tonight. Ferry operators say they're under pressure to raise fares. The public urged to stay away from poultry markets while traveling on the mainland. And popularity ranking for Hong Kong's public spaces.